So let me say a few words. I'm, I'm Wang Yip. I'm a substitution for Professor Yin Zhen Pan, who, who is the, actually the organizer of this um, online seminars, um, uh, which is for the Delta uh, Young Astronomer at what this. And Professor Kevin Han got the awards, uh, I think several years ago, was it? Uh, uh, the, but you can see him, you know, he's a real young. So you can imagine when, how young he was when he got the award. I'm not that now young. he's uh, he's a major professor, <laughs> a huge professor now in Munich. He's moving to he's now still in 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 West Bern, being a director of the Center for Habita Habitability or something right, also planet. Yeah, but he's uh, moving to to Munich uh, and building up a group. Uh, I think it would be very promising, very interesting uh, place to be in Munich besides the Oktoberfest and from now on. The, uh, so with uh, uh, Kevin Han, he, 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 he did his graduate, undergraduate in National Singapore University. And afterward, he went to Colorado to get his PhD. And uh, he spent only four years in his uh, PhD study. Yes. Uh, uh, so now he's, he's uh, I would say, I guess he's uh, 40 years old or 39 years old, if not younger. Um, 43. The... Oh, okay. okay. Uh, and the... And he's a specialist on, on exoplanets um, and on, also on planetary atmosphere, which are really something very really complicated thing I could never understand. So I'm very happy to hear him to give this talk. And the title is uh, planetary, uh, Exoplanetary Atmosphere, Albedo and Phase Curve. And as we, some of us who have been working on small bodies like asteroids, we know how important those uh, phase curves are, you know, in telling the, the physical characteristic uh, of, 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 of planetary objects from afar. That you cannot resolve them, and then the Professor Kevin Hain, he has a genius idea and method to derive the physical properties. And you wrote a book, right? Or uh, 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 one or two books? I, I have a tw twenty seventeen textbook that, um, when I look back, I wish I could have done better. So I will write the second edition soon. Okay, okay. But that one, the, the new book got the prize from uh, from the AAS Astronomical Astronomical Society, right? Um, in 2018, yes. Yeah, right. So, so it's a huge achievement for a young person. And of course, besides that, he has this our Delta Young Young Astronomer Award. And I believe that I believe that I'm sure that I will bet on it. He will get more awards in future. Let's let's wait and see. Okay, Kelvin, it's all yours now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wing, for your very kind introduction um, and for saying such nice things. I have very fond memories of the trip to Taiwan, and I really hope to uh, come back. Actually, before I start, I would. I have actually one request. It would be really nice if those of you who are comfortable can just turn on your camera <laughs> because otherwise I'm not, I'm not just speaking to a, to a blank uh, screen. It would be nice to see some faces if you don't mind. Um, um, then um, the, the second thing I wanna say is that I, I set aside a um, um, couple of hours on my schedule so I can go a bit slower. I, you can ask questions whenever you like. And after the talk, if you would like, you can, stick around and we can have a discussion. The discussion can be about the talk or it can be about career or whatever you want. So, so we can have a, about two hours together if you can spare the time. So um, I would like to now um, show you this. So, so again, thank you for having me. I, as I said, I, I have very fond memories of Taiwan and I would really like to go back sometime in the future when, especially when you gather all of the the uh, Delta awardees. Um, so when I, I was asked to give this talk, I had I had two choices. First, first you can hear me, right? Everyone can hear me. So so I had I had two choices. I could either give you like a review talk where I would show you all of the things that my group is doing, uh, which I can do at some point, or I could just focus on one very specific. Uh, result that we got recently. And this is the choice I made. And also because I'm very excited by this result. This result is described in two papers, uh, both of which I, I was lead author on this year. So the result is very new. So the first result was published in Nature Astronomy in uh, at the end of August. So it's very new. And then the second result was published a few months earlier in FJ Letters. And there are really only three collaborators on this. One is um, Brad Morris is an observer in my group. Daniel Kitzman is a senior uh, researcher and a theorist in my group. 
And Li Ming Li is a professor in Houston whom I have never met in my life. I just emailed him and I asked him for Cassini data. I don't even know how he looks like. And he was very responsive over email and he gave me lots of data. So we wrote a paper together without actually ever speaking to each other. Um, so this is the, the result um, um, published on 30th of August. Uh, the, the title is uh, Closed Form Up and Issue Solutions of Geometric Albedos and Reflected Light Phase Curves. So by the end of this talk, I, I really hope that um, you, uh, you can understand what closed form, what up and issue, what geometric albedos, and what phase curves actually mean. That's the, that's the point of the talk. And, and I'm very proud of this result. I consider this the, the most important result of my career so far, because this is the approximate, and you will, again, get a chance to understand what approximate means. But it's the very general solution to a mathematical problem in classical astronomy uh, first post by the Princeton astronomer Henry Norris Russell in, in 1916. So if you're convinced of this statement, then this is the approximate but general solution to a problem that is 105 years old. So um, before I launch into a description of this paper, I just wanted to give you some background as to how I, I came to this result. So exoplanets are planets orbiting other stars beyond the solar system. You, you, you already know this. Uh, exoplanet detection is now routine. It's very common. It's so routine that the field is firmly established and two Nobel Prizes were given out two years ago. The, the next frontier, which everyone wants to do, is the detailed characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. And the reason why you care about exoplanet atmospheres is because um, unlike for the solar system where you can send machines and probes, uh, these exoplanets are really, really far away. So there's no chance of you reaching them. And therefore, everything needs to be done um, uh, using remote sensing but a, a very challenging form of remote sensing. So beyond measuring mass and radius, uh, the, the, only thing you, the only other thing you can do that just goes beyond mass, radius, and density is to measure the, the spectra of these atmospheres and then try to say something about the atmospheric chemistry of these exoplanets. And atmospheric chemistry can be used in two ways as a tool. It can be used to tell you something about the formation history of the exoplanet, or it can be used to tell you something about the, the, the so-called habitability conditions of the exoplanets. And in the distant future, if we search for so-called biosignatures, it will probably also come through the atmosphere. So this is the, the broad brush um, um, sense of where everyone is trying to go in the field. But then there are two main um, obstacles, uh, at least from a theoretician's point of view, when you try to interpret these spectra. One is something uh, called parameter degeneracies, meaning that um, if you have a model describing the spectrum, then many different combinations of the parameter values will give you the same spectrum, right? So, so meaning that instead of a single answer for your parameter value, like the abundance of water or the abundance of methane, you get uh, probability distributions of abundance of water and abundance of other molecules that are correlated with each other. And so, uh, any approach that uh, interprets these spectra robustly has to take this into account. The second obstacle is, of course, always that we, we never completely understand the physics or chemistry. This is always true. Otherwise, we, we don't have a job. And the two um, parameter degeneracies and incomplete understanding of physics and chemistry are, are related in many ways. And, and one of the big problems that affects both parameter degeneracies and incomplete understanding of physics is actually the problem of clouds and hazes and aerosols. This is, a, this is a very hard problem that permeates many branches of physics. So I, I show five branches here. And, and uh, broadly speaking, it can be summarized as uh, our inability to understand how macroscopic uh, structures form or behave because of our inability to either form, either, uh, form or describe uh, the physics of microscopic particles. So for example, in climate science on Earth, one of the biggest obstacles to predicting uh, uh, climate change and global warming is actually how the formation of uh, water, water clouds. And, and, where you and where you form the clouds, whether it's close to the Earth or away from the Earth, um, the height of the cloud will determine whether the cloud has a net cooling or net warming effect. And since the, the cooling and the warming are, are large numbers and you want to know the difference between these two large, large numbers, 
And the difference between these two large numbers depends on your ability to, to understand the microphysics of these clouds. This, this becomes a very hard problem. Uh, the other area where uh, clouds and hazes become very important are in the solar system. Um, this comes up in many solar system bodies. One example is early Mars. So um, if you look at the geology of Mars, this suggests that early Mars probably had some kind of surface water, whether it's persistent or intermittent is being debated. Uh, but, but the atmospheric scientists uh, struggle to find a model that produces water on early Mars. And part of the puzzle is because um, CO2 ice clouds seem to be part of the story and it's difficult to form them from first principles. Planet formation is a field that again for decades um, relies on our ability to understand how big structures, planets form from smaller structures like embryos and pebbles and so on. And again, this is one of the areas where the microscopic affects the macroscopic. Same with, same with brown dwarfs. In brown dwarfs, there's a, an unsolved mystery called the LT transition, how do cloudy L dwarfs evolve to become cloud-free T dwarfs? Again, hinges on your ability to understand clouds and hazes and aerosols. So not surprisingly, when you get to exoplanet atmospheres, which, which is a very young field compared to these other field, we have exactly the same problem, right? So we would like to look at exoplanet atmospheres and we would like to extract, we would like to make statements like this atmosphere has this much water and this molecule and but it doesn't have that molecule. Unfortunately, these statements are degenerate with how you model the clouds and hazes in these atmospheres. So overall, this is a hard problem. So today I'm not gonna pretend that I can give you the answer to this problem, I, I, I cannot. But the papers I just mentioned to you, I think are a new tool, a new way to extract information from data so that you can then advance your understanding of clouds and hazes in different objects. So you should think of it as a mathematical solution that then gives you a new tool for data analysis. And this is what I would try to uh, describe to you in the next 45 minutes or so.